Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hopefully, y'all are enjoying the conference so far. All right, all right. Did y'all like that lunch? Okay, okay don't be too full. They're going to fall asleep on me. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Lupe Washington, and I am the division director for the Harris County Department, um, Harris County Public Health Department's new Community Health and Violence Prevention Division. And our division, it got started um, when I got hired in mid-December. <laughs> And when I was hired, it was like, we have these great programs, we have a new approach that we want to take to violence prevention. Um, and on top of that, um, can you get started by March? We're like, let's see what we can do, what we can make happen. So today I'm going to present to you a little bit about what we are doing here in Harris County uh, with our efforts and then let y'all know where we're at with our programming uh, with the understanding, of course, that we are in a pilot phase. So these are brand new initiatives and we are just getting started. Uh, so they are not full-blown programs. We understand we have a long way to go uh, and we understand that we're going to need everybody's help to help us get there. And so just a little bit back of my background, um, I spent over 24 years as a juvenile justice practitioner. My Harris County juvenile probation family, some of them are in here today. Uh, hey! <laughs> uh, so I got my start there at Harris County Juvenile Probation, started out as an intensive supervision officer, then went to go help start the gang unit for the department. Uh, and then became a supervisor in the courts and, you know, enjoyed being in the courtroom, you know, where we back then think we were getting about 27,000 cases a year. So we were moving a lot of cases every day of the young people with the cases being filed. The number's a lot lower today. Thank goodness. Um, and then from the court, I became a court administrator uh, where I got to read all the reports <laughs> of the kids going to court. Uh, and then from there, I was able to have a position where I kind of got to make it my own. And so I was the administrator of public affairs and information and did that for a number of years before an opportunity came up in Brazos County. Uh, where I was able to go and become the assistant chief of the juvenile services department there. And then, you know, was trying to make my way back home because I did commute from Cyprus to Bryan, Texas for over seven years. Um, and so made a decision when this position came open uh, to apply just because it really, really resonated with me. It seemed like an opportunity to look at violence prevention from actually the perspective that I already had, you know, in juvenile probation, asking all the whys. Why? But why? Ms. Washington, we want to bring this kid in, but why? <laughs> you know, do they have transportation? Are they hungry? What's going on with the family? Do they have water? And so this was just a really smooth transition. And I'll let you know that in just the eight months that I've been in the position, it's truly for now, for me, become a true labor of love. And so hopefully y'all get a lot out of this presentation, again, with the understanding that we're just getting started. So we all know, and we've been hearing all day, gun violence, homicides, and then the latest statistic, you know, from the CDC that gun violence is the number one cause of death for children under the age of 18 now. And because of that, you know, we're really needing to look at different ways that are complementary to the strategies that are already out there, complementary to our law enforcement strategies. And so this is kind of where we're coming in. We know Harris County, Houston, uh, much like the entire country, is, ha is experiencing the same thing when it comes to the increase in crime. And of course, again, based on what we've heard from our speakers, it's no secret that our communities of color, you know, and our black and brown men are the ones who are most impacted most of the time. Okay, so we understand that our county is not exempt, but we're all working together. And I am really, really grateful. We have some great partnerships already. We work very closely with the city of Houston. We wanna make sure we're not duplicating our service areas or duplicating our efforts. And so we work really closely with their team as well as they're rolling out their pro programs in the city of Houston. So we wanna make the most of the resources and we wanna be really good stewards of the city and the county's dollars that have been given to these programs. So again, new solutions. 
And actually, it's kind of new solutions here, but based kind of what, on what we heard from Mr. Benny earlier, you know, they were doing it in other cities and other states uh, before it came here to Texas and before we came to Harris County, uh, where we're looking at trying to look at crime and prevent it and look at it from a public health perspective. And what does that mean? Because we wanna make sure that we're doing things that are going to actually make an impact. Uh, I'm very proud to say Harris County is a performance-based budget county. And what does that mean? That means we gotta show our work to keep the money coming. I'm all for that. We got to be doing the job. We got to be making sure we have the outcomes, you know, that we say we're going to get. So we have key performance indicators, you know, that we strive to achieve, you know, and I'm one of those and my staff and the ones who are in here, they know, you know, I don't really do mediocrity. Uh, I believe in really making the impact and we do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. Okay. And so we're here looking at it from a public health approach. And what does that look like? Again, everything that Mr. Benny mentioned, Charles Blow mentioned, you know, and even Dr. Temple just finished talking about. And when we look about at this pyramid, what are the causes that can lead someone to commit a crime? For many of them and many of our communities, you know, it's survival, right? It's about survival on a daily basis. Children can't go to school and concentrate if Number one, they're hungry. Number two, there's not adequate, they don't have lights, they don't have enough food. You know, I've heard school teachers say they go out and do visits and there were holes in the middle of the living room floor, you know, to the ground. How are children supposed to focus and concentrate if that's the situation that they're living in? Okay, but are we asking the whys? They go to school, get in trouble, and what's the first thing we do? We want to criminalize them. Right, And so here we're wanting to get to the root causes. And that's what a public health approach is. We're looking at what are the root causes that can lead someone you know, to a life of crime. And we're gonna talk about the initiatives that we have you know, to try and do just this. Because our number one thing for our department is really to be out there preventing the gun violence. That's what we're here to do. Interrupt and stop the gun violence you know, with whatever we can do. We want to get people to the point where they are self-sufficient and we lead them to pro-social lifestyles. You know, that's the goal. And we'll talk about how we're gonna get there. So our first program we wanna talk about is our Alternative 911 Response Program, our HEART program, the Holistic Assistance Response Team. And this is where we have teams of two a certified EMT and a crisis intervention specialist. They're out there right now. Again, we're piloting in one area right now in the northern part of the county. That is District 1 for the Sheriff's Office, which incorporates 148 miles north of Bellway 8. If you're from Houston, you're familiar. From 45 north all the way over you know, to 249. So that's a huge area. So far, we launched this program on March 21st. And through August the 20th, the teams have already responded to 593 nonviolent calls. Again, they're nonviolent calls because we want law enforcement to be out there ready and, and able to respond to the calls that do involve the violence. And I did want to recognize at this time, our heart program manager that we have for our department, Ms. Maggie. She's sitting up in the bar. Stand up, Maggie. Let them know. You're the heart program manager. <laughs> That's Ms. Maggie's son. She's our heart program manager. Now we do subcontract this program out. And I also wanted to make, recognize Ms. Michelle Patino, who is the owner of DEMA. And they are our subcontractors. They're the ones hiring the folks that are out there, the teams of two. And Ms. Quinn, who's absolutely wonderful. Hey, and Miss Kathy, who's now their operations director. They're the ones who hire the folks to go out there and respond to these calls. So we're working very closely with the sheriff's office. They also have a heart program manager assigned to this program. We're identifying those calls that do not involve violence, okay? So that our police officers, like it was said earlier today, we expect them to respond to everything. Well, they don't necessarily have all the training to respond to every situation, right? So that sometimes we do need somebody who has that background in mental health. Maybe they just need minor medical attention and you can have an EMT take care of that so EMS doesn't have to take up the time with that call. And again, 
our goal for the whole year was going to be 750 calls. And we're already, from March to August 20th, we're already at the 593 calls that they've answered. Yes, Michelle. What? See? See? This is how fast the numbers are jumping. Thank you, Michelle. So we've already hit 700, and our goal was 750 for the whole 12, 12 months. And so the team is out there doing an extraordinary job. Now, the top calls that we're getting that they're responding to are welfare checks, some mental health calls. Okay, so again, they're out there, but they're not just responding to the calls. One thing y'all want to know, y'all have heard from Director Robinson, my boss, uh, I'll let y'all know, she doesn't like the word referrals, okay? <laughs> so we're talking to her if you're going to engage in conversation. We don't believe in the word referrals. We believe in connections. We connect people to their services. So we don't just give phone numbers. Here, good luck. Call them, you know, call them Monday morning. Hopefully you get a response. We call and verify, did you get the help you needed? How else can we help you? You know, that's what we're doing at our department and with everyone that we're contracting with, no, that's the outcome. Okay, that's gonna be the outcome. And we're verifying that this is actually happening because we don't, so many people get lost in the system. I mean, let's think about it. Some of us who are educated, there are some systems that we get lost in, right? We don't know how to do certain things, you know? So we wanna make sure that we're going to, if we have to handhold them, that's what we're going to do to get them the services that they need. And there's some amazing stories that have already come out. I mean, just what, two weeks ago, they were driving a lady who was a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. We finally found, after hours of calling, a shelter for her in Galveston County. We didn't have anywhere here, so the team drove her all the way to Galveston County, where she's going to be able to get that assistance for about 30 or 40 days. But we'll follow up to see what else that she's going to need. Just people who are grateful because perhaps there's a mother. There was a mother with, I think, dementia who was just walking to the store, you know, just standing in the corner of a store. The family didn't know where she was, so the heart team was called out. And then we finally were able to get a hold of the family, and they were very grateful that we were able to have their mother you know, have her safe and then return her to them. So there's just, there are many stories and we're tracking all of that just because we know that the numbers say one thing, but they don't tell the full story. We know the data is important and we're all about data and we're all about program evaluation, but there are the stories behind those statistics and those numbers. So again, that's just, those are just a few of the stories that we have. So again, because law enforcement, we want them to be out there responding. So again, now we have these trained teams that are going out there to respond for them. Um, and it's gonna, again, we're talking about connections to appropriate services. Uh, and then they're in their own uniforms. We did not want them to look like law enforcement. You know, again, a lot of people out there, especially if in, they're in stressful or distress, you know, they may have a different type of reaction to uniforms or a certain law enforcement uniforms. So they have their own uniforms. And I'm going to show you all the next slide. And this is their ve the vehicles. And they're wrapped. And we have the wording in English and Spanish. And then as we move and grow and expand to other areas of the county where other languages are spoken, we will have them in Vietnamese or Chinese or the other languages where we're going to be setting up. That bottom left picture was the very, very first heart call that the team went out there, went out on. And you see Michelle was out part of that call. Uh, and then District 1, remember I mentioned District 1, this is the area that they're currently in. Okay, District 1 in the northern part of Harris County is where we're at right now. Uh, and then them engaging with the resident on the bottom right-hand side. This is what we want it to become. This is what we, we want them to be the fourth responder in our county. Okay, now this is in addition to all the other great programs that the Sheriff's Office has. And if y'all were in their session earlier today, you probably heard from Deputy Raven and Sergeant Williams and their teams on all the great alternative programs they have. But this is in addition to that. So again, we're complementary strategies to law enforcement. So we want them to become that fourth responder here in the county. Uh, and so again, as we look at the numbers and gather the data, we'll be looking to see where we go next with the program. Everything is data driven. So the area was selected because it was the area with the highest volume of nonviolent calls. 
that is how they were selected. Now, <clears throat> it just so happened is also that one of the beats was also one of the beats with the highest rates of violence. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about another program that we have targeted in that area. But this is what we want it to look like. And again, with the Sheriff's Office and their support and allowing us to have our heart program manager there with them, it really helps us. We all work as a team. Uh, we have almost daily tag ups and meetings so we know where we're at and what the needs are. Uh, we're just really happy and pleased with where we are, but we're not completely satisfied. You know, we always know that there's room for growth. Our other program is our Community Violence Interruption Program. And this is, this is a program where we are hiring our own, we call them outreach specialists, but they're in other jurisdictions, they're considered credible messengers or violence interrupters. And we're hiring them because they're the ones who have the ties to the communities that we're gonna be in. Okay, so you see my staff with their short, the shirts that they have on, most of them, a uh, few, several of them that are out in the hallways, they're our outreach specialists. That's who we've hired. So currently we're in two pilot neighborhoods and I'll uh, talk about those in a minute, but they're the ones with the ties to these communities because they're the ones that the people are gonna listen to, right? They're the ones that can go up, engage in conversations with the people and they, because they come from those communities and they already have ties in those communities, people trust them, so they're credible. Right, people trust them, so they're credible. They know that they have their best interest in mind. And we do, we wanna make sure we're going up to them, they're engaging with them. They are engaging with the individuals at the highest risk of being the perpetrators of crime or being the victims of crime. Okay, and I'm gonna share a story of how that's actually working here in a moment. So the neighborhoods that we're in, we're in four zip codes. We're in 77021, 077033, 051, and 090, which is in that Cypress Station area, which is also that area north, north part of the county where the heart program also is, okay? And again, we focus on those individuals at the highest risk, okay? So our staff are going out there on a daily basis and they're locating those hotspots, those corner stores, the businesses, the laundry mats, and they're just going up and then they're asking questions. Sometimes they're being referred by somebody who knows somebody, okay? And because they know the neighborhoods, they know how to engage them. Now, we don't just send them out there. Uh, Y'all have heard Dr. Chico Tillman's name mentioned, and he will be our closer tomorrow for our conference. So we are contracting with Dr. Tillman and his colleague to train our staff on how to do that and do it safely because Realistically, there is an element of danger to this job, okay? So we understand that, and we don't just send them out there. They're actually going through training uh, for this program. So we're really pleased to be contracting with him, and he's trained all of our staff. And like I said, my other four outreach specialists that we just hired couldn't be here, and they'll be upset with me for a while. But this was the week that they could be trained, and so that's, they're back at the office being trained. And at this time, I did want to introduce Ms. Anditria Lockett, who is our Violence Interruption Program Manager for this program. Stand up, Anditria. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So again, we're working in these neighborhoods initially. Why? Again, because when we looked at the statistics, these were the zip codes that had the highest rates of gun violence, and then when you added in the social vulnerability indexes, these are the neighborhoods that came up at the top. Okay, so we couldn't not go. Even though we're a county agency and three of these zip codes are in the city, we couldn't go there because of the numbers. You know, we just had to bring the programs there. And I have to say, we've started community engagement back in the first week of January. We've had stakeholder meetings, they're ongoing. Uh, we have Commissioner Ellis's office that we partner closely with. You know, James is here, so we get invited to all the events. They invite us to their meetings, they get invited to ours. We definitely are getting community input and insight on how, why we can't do it without them. We just heard you have to bring them to the table and that's who we wanna hear from. You know, how, where, where should we be? We understand we've had plenty of meetings <laughs> and people say, well, we need more parks and we need more youth programs and we need to clean up this lot. And Dr. Tillman taught us and he said very eloquently at one meeting, he said, we can do all of that but if we don't stop the shootings and the dying, nobody's gonna go. People are not gonna feel safe. 
And so that's the point that we want to get to as a county, working with the other stakeholders, the community, the city of Houston, to make sure that people are starting to feel safer because we're going to help with the rates of the gun violence. And so again, our outreach specialists have been out there. Um, they, one of them was out there at the end of March, beginning of uh, April. The other teams got out there in June, and now we have the next group that's gonna get trained. We also have a hospital-based violence interruption program that we're working on. We're working on launching that as quickly as possible. Uh, we are still in the planning stages with Ben Tobb and the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. Uh, they will be hiring someone to specifically work for this program. Again, individuals from this, these four zip codes that come in and are victims of gun violence or interpersonal violence, they're gonna call our staff and our staff will be there to meet them at bedside as soon as possible so we can try and help that family plan their care coordination and help them upon discharge to follow up with whatever needs that they have. Another reason we're doing that is because we're also trying to prevent retaliations, okay? We're trying to prevent these retaliations, so we're trying to get there as quickly as possible. Now, we're also really excited that HCA Northwest, which is the hospital in Cypress Station in 77090, they chased us down, <laughs> they, they contacted us, and they said, we already have somebody that is dedicated that we can give you, they're ready. That agreement will probably be done before the Bentob agreement. And so, and so we're excited about getting started because the numbers there here, especially recently, have also been very high as it relates to gun violence. And so we're excited that we'll be able to partner with HCA Northwest and that hospital-based program will probably you know, get launched off here probably within the next month and a half or so, as soon as we can clear the agreements through commissioner's court with their approval. So our outreach specialists, credible messengers. To get hired on with us, they don't necessarily even have to have a high school diploma or GED. They just have to complete one if they come in without one within a year. Okay, and again, these are the individuals who live, who have deep ties in the communities that we're in. Uh, we have a lot of people who apply, but it's not your typical kind of outreach work, okay? This is not, you know, going out there, hey, how you doing? You know, no, you're out there engaging with individuals, again, at the highest risk of being the perpetrators of violence. So, you know, we need some special people. And like I said, when you see them in uniform, you can talk to them, and a lot of my outreach specialists will tell you exactly the kind of work that they're doing. They can have been justice impacted, so some of them do have criminal histories. However, there are some offenses that we, you know, are ineligible for hire. Okay, we're not gonna hire anyone with offenses against children, the elderly, you know, the mentally or physically disabled. But these are full-time, full county benefit positions. You know, and so for many of them, it is their first opportunity in that professional setting. And I have to tell you, I'm just really proud. I'm really proud of, of where they are, you know, especially compared to, you know, where they've come from. You know, for having been, come from a family who's been just as impacted. I have eight siblings, I'm the oldest. Four of them have been incarcerated, okay? And one of my brothers was certified at the age of 15 and signed for 20 years. So I, I've been there. So one of my staff, was, he's making his spreads for lunch. And he's like, I'm like, oh, I know all about spreads. You know, he's like, what do you know about spreads? I was like, I know all about spreads. My brother made spreads as soon as he got out. You know, I think he's still making spreads. Spreads, they, they make their own meals, okay? Chips, Doritos, what have you. Whatever they find, they put together. So I have to say that our team, overall, the majority of us have been impacted in one way or another, everyone has a true passion and desire for the work that we're doing. And so I tell people now, for me, at this stage in my career, and people say, well, you know, a lot of people think that just speaks to my age now. <laughs> it's just like, it just means I've been around for a while. Uh, but we have a true passion, and this has truly become my labor of love with this division. So, what do we expect to get out of these programs? Well, we want fewer incidents of violence out there. We want people to feel safer. We wanna connect more people to their health services, 
mental health services, whatever their needs are, we want to be the ones to help them navigate our systems. Again, we're trying to make them healthier, you know, become self-sufficient, but also lead them to that pro-social lifestyle. So again, they're not fully dependent on any other systems and they can feel comfortable and confident. And then they're the ones out there, you know, like the Mr. Benny Lees who are going out there to try and change their neighborhoods. You know, one of my staff was very real. We brought him in. He said, I was a part of tearing my community down and now I wanna be a part of restoring it and making it better. You know, and that's what he's doing. We are, again, doing ongoing program evaluations. Uh, we're big on data, statistics again. Is it working? You know, why is it working? Is it not working? How do we need to pivot? What do we need to change to make it better? You know, how do we need to regroup? Uh, who, need to we, who do we need to bring to the table? Because again, we don't, we don't profess to know everything. Okay, we know that there's, there are things that we're gonna learn from community member, members and from other agencies. You know, I see OG1, I see OG1 in here. See, like him, <laughs> right there. Uh, to bring people in who can help us, you know, as we continue to evolve our programs. Our impact so far. So far, we have actually mitigated three possible gun violent incidents. So this needs to be updated in the South Park, Sunnyside area. The last one happened just last week where one of my staff was in a store. He was just in one of the stores and something was about to go down and somebody revealed a weapon and he was able to, there you go my folks back there. Y'all can turn and see my outreach specialist back there. Raise your hands, raise your hands. Those are my outreach specialists. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and uh, I would bring Mr. Russell, but I'm, I'm trying to recap, tell your story, sir. Um, but he was able to mitigate that incident of gun violence in the actual store and keep people from dying that day. Okay, so that was the, 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 the third one that we've had. The other incident, we got a call, again, because of our outreach specialist connections in that area, where there was a high profile incident and they were called to meet the family at the hospital and by going there, they were able to prevent an incident of retaliation from that family because people died. Because they were there, they were able to keep an uncle from going out and retaliating. Okay, so that's the impact in just the few short months that we've been out there that we've been able to have. They've engaged with 114 high-risk residents already. Uh, and we've had five individuals who've been connected to employment with us working with them. And again, we don't do it alone. We refer them and connect them to other programs, the City of Houston's reentry program, our own health department, our own public health department, and the services that we provide to help them navigate. So whoever, whatever we need to do is how we're trying to get them connected. <clears throat> we do have this new program that we're working. This is a program that was uh, given to our division and we're happy to be a part of. These fundings are from the American Rescue Plan Act funding that we have. All the other programs, the violence interruption and the heart programs are all Harris County general fund dollars. But this program, five areas across Harris County have been identified and we're looking to see where improvements are needed. And when I say we, we're doing that with community feedback. So we're starting in Cypress Station and our staff have been conducting surveys with the outreach that we do to ask the residents themselves, what do you need to feel safe? How do you feel living here? How long have you lived here? Well, you know, if you'd like to see more lighting or sidewalks, where? So we're asking them for their input and we're not just coming in and say, oh, we think, we think one should be good here. We think one should be good there. So we are working in conjunction with the office of the county, uh, county administrator, along with the county engineer's office, because they're the ones who are gonna carry out the programs. But we're wanting to make sure that we're going to improve. All of this has to do with safety and public safety. Again, also part of the answer of helping people feel safer uh, in their neighborhoods. In one area, we're like, we don't need more lighting, we just need the trees cut so we can, the light can come through. 
that's what we need. And that's important information to have. And again, we have to ask the people who live there because they're the ones who know best. And so these five areas have been identified. There is one in each precinct of the county. We will start in Cypress Station. Uh, Sunnyside is also one of the areas that's targeted, and then A-Leaf, and then we have the East Aldine area where we'll be working with precinct two. So again, we're looking forward to getting some of these programs off and going. So again, our residents can, can have a say and we can help make it safer for them. So to date, so again, I'm starting mid-December <laughs> and like you gotta start these programs. So I'm really pleased that within eight months, you know, we've been able to hire 18 people for our team to get this going. So I have the program managers, the supervisors, uh, but in addition to that, it's not just our program, it's another important program that's getting started at Harris County Public Health, and that's Access Harris. Access Harris is going to be the wraparound care coordination plan that our residents are going to receive. Again, we're working with the other agencies across the county, all the other safety net departments. Uh, and Ms. Sandra Calzada, who's in the back of the room, is that manager, uh, the IMDT manager for that program. So when we have a resident in our violence prevention cohort that has compounding issues, let's just say they're on probation, they're on parole, they have a substance abuse problem, they may need housing, temporary housing or short term, whatever their needs, they have compounding issues. Those residents will be handed over to the access staff and then they are gonna help them carry, carry out their care coordination plan. This is something that other jurisdictions have started, not a whole lot, but Director Robinson helped pioneer this in Sonoma County and now she's brought it here to Harris County. And so there have been meetings and meetings going on and the, the, the staff have been working really hard to work with the other safety net departments, uh, juvenile probation, adult probation, you know, everybody who's gonna be a part, housing, the homeless coalition. So there, there are different cohorts that they're going to be serving. We're just the first one. So we'll be getting started with them and then they have other cohorts that they'll be serving. So they'll have a black maternal health cohort, they'll have a homeless cohort, youth aging out of foster care, you know, and then a re-entry cohort that they'll be working with. So a lot, you know, some of these are gonna overlap, right? We have people who are gonna be in multiple, but we're gonna do our best to give them the care coordination that they need. The beauty of it is that everybody's on the same page about one resident. So you're looking at one screen, you're looking at one system, and we're not overwhelming families. You know, as a former JPO, sometimes we just gave them, okay, you got this appointment on this day, and you're gonna come see me on this day, and then you go take your drug test on this day, and on this day you go to uh, drug treatment, and on this day you go to anger management, and oh yeah, you still gotta go to school. You know, so we overwhelm people sometimes. But if we work together, then everybody knows where residents are having to go, and we're not overwhelming or trying to duplicate services. And again, we're making the best use of dollars and people's time as we help residents get to uh, where they need to be in their health and their well-being and their safety. Um, we do have a gun, a gun violence campaign that's coming out. The billboards have been approved. We have some radio announcements that have already started. Uh, we will have some TV ads that will be going out. And uh, some of our outreach folks are on those billboards, so you'll get to see them out there. Because again, we wanna bring attention to the fact that gun violence is a public health crisis. You know, this it is gonna take multiple it's a multi-pronged approach, right, to a multifaceted problem. And that's what we want to do, you know, here to be able to serve our people and do it to the best of our ability. And that's all I have for my presentation. <laughs> what questions do you have? How much time do we have for questions, Kyle? Okay, all right. Awesome. Yeah, great question. So MCOT is part, is under the city of Houston and they work with the Houston Police Department. Okay, and this is where, that's where that's housed. HART program is county. So we are working with the sheriff's office 
and the 911 dispatch that they work under. Now, again, HART is one program. The Sheriff's Office also has their other programs similar to MCOT in the city, where they have the CORE program and the CERT program, where they do team up crisis and mental health professionals with law enforcement. So in those, you still have law enforcement going out to those calls. Uh, in the HART program, you do not have law enforcement unless the team gets to the scene and there is something that really wasn't reported in the initial call, maybe there's an element of danger or a weapon, then the team is gonna go retreat and then they're gonna call law enforcement to come in. So that's the difference. That's with the city of Houston. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. zip codes that you listed. Yeah. And I was, my question is, uh, do y'all partner with the faith-based community as well? Because a lot of times, me being a criminal justice professional as myself, I get a lot of calls from people from my church asking for help. And I think your proactive approach in working with the faith-based community could be really an uh, amazing tag team approach. Absolutely. That They're actually the ones who first opened their doors when we started our outreach back in January. So we were able to go into the churches first. Um, and we have churches that are continuing to open their doors for us and allow us to do presentations, speak to their congregations, but also receive their input. So yes, we've involved them from the very beginning, from the first week in January when we started our engagement with the community. You know, it was virtual initially. You know, and then we went to hybrid. Of course, now we're doing some, you know, more in person. Uh, but yes, we've definitely invited the faith-based community, uh, and they've been extremely supportive of the work that we're doing. So, yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, yes. Excuse me. It's like I'm not loud, so I will wait. Um, what are y'all doing to make sure that you're um, implementing the program? I guess with the 988 rollout, since it specifically looks at you know mental health more than it does at the kind of crime piece. Yeah, so the 988 number is the now the National Suicide Hotline number. And so again, that goes through and is incorporated in the Sheriff's Office. So it's similar. So depending on what the call is, you know, is there an element of danger with that call or not? And that will determine whether or not the teams are gonna go out to those calls. So yeah, it's already been, you know, incorporated and we already look at how it's working with them. Yes, thank you. Another question, you guys? Or did I just do that good a job of explaining everything? <laughs> well, again, I do want to thank you all, uh, and I'll give you all a few minutes before we wrap this up. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to participate in our inaugural violence prevention conference. Uh, we ask that you network and get to know each other, you know, because that's how we're going to do it. You know, what is it? We do it better together. Um, and so we know we're going to go further because it's going gonna, gonna to take all of us. And again, we'll be looking to see how we're going to grow and expand. We have another question? Yes. Yes. Do you want to answer it? So you're out there doing it. <laughs> this is Mr. Russell Bassard, the one who's the one who prevented that last incident happening last week at that store. So he was the one who was able to go there and intervene and prevent that incident. Right, right. Woo woo! I'm gonna let him uh, answer that real quick, and then I'm gonna get to your question, Mr. Truly. First of all, good afternoon to everyone. Is it on? Her? Hello, hello. Use this one. Mic check. Okay. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess to answer that, that question, just as Ms. Lupe stated earlier, um, just by the, me canvassing and being in the right place at the right time and through the, uh, the training, through... I'm a man of faith, and I'm going to say it was an act of God. Um, I was able to be in the right place at the right time to prevent, interrupt 
what I saw was a very volatile situation that was turning bad as I was actually right there. So what I say to those who question, why do we have police officers and have outreach specialists? Police officers tend to respond to a crime, to the gun violence, once it's already been committed. We try to interject, deter, get in front of some of those incidents that we see occurring or may hear from the community. We build in rapport with that community. We're connecting with people of that community. And then at the same time, as I stated, just being in the right place. If you're consistent and if you really care, then you can also be in the right place at the right time. So that's, that's the difference between the law enforcement opposed to outreach specialists. We're using some of our lived experiences, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going out, and it is a dangerous job. But again, me being a man of faith, uh, I, I myself and my team, we're prayed up. And we're, we're going out and we're trying to make a difference because of our compassion, because of us caring. And we hope that you, it, you share that same sentiment. So that was what I wanted to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, I think, did Mr. Trulia, did you have a comment? Yes. I want to go to him and then I'll go to you, sweetie. Yes. I'm also a former law enforcement and federal law enforcement. I want to add on to what he was saying. There's a difference between law enforcement and community outreach. Law enforcement comes in to be reactionary. Community outreach is preventative. We don't want to ever get to a state where we need an officer. We want people in the community. I mean, you react better to your friends and your family more than you do a stranger. I think their effort here is to become that family, that friend, to compensate for that anger or that frustration that you have with things going on in your life. So I see that as the sole purpose behind what she's doing. And I happen to have been on a conference call with DC through the PSP program, which the Harris County Sheriff's Office is a part of. And that was in June. And the program had just come out, I believe, um, in December, January. But the March numbers had come out and they were talking about how excited they were about the heart program. And let me say, that word is getting out. It's a great program. Y'all are doing great work, and I thank you for that. The other reason I had my hand up was to ask a question in regards to um, the 77021 area code being so close to the medical center, and you having uh, the program with HCA in the north in the Cypress area. How are you going to deal with that situation being so close to the medical center and not having really, not even an emergency, um, I forget what they're called, those little care centers in that area and dealing with medical issues going on through that, the medical program you have? Yeah, so the other hospital we're working to start our programming is, is at Bentob because they are a level one trauma. So we're still in the process of getting that program going because that's going to be where our victims you know, come to the hospitals for the 77021 and 033 and 051 zip codes. Uh, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna be there as well. And one question right there, yes. Yeah, I'm just impressed with the community outreach specialist. And here is about the training that they receive. Yes, so Dr. Tillman and his coworker come for a full week and they go over everything from how to engage over mediating incidents, how do you approach, you know, everything that they're going to need when they're out there in the community, they're being trained on a different topic each and every day. So it's 40 hours that they come in and do that training. But we also have ongoing technical assistance with him. So if there's a situation that we need his help on, 
then we can call him and get that assistance you know, from him. And there's a lot of role playing that they do during that training. Uh, because again, they, they're going into situations that are potentially, that can become really dangerous. So we wanna make sure that our staff is, is very safe. Yes, sir, yes. First of all, I just wanna thank you and your work you're doing, but I just wanna to say to all your specialists, after doing this work for like 30 years, I'm a gang intervention specialist, I'm a peer mental specialist, I'm a recovery coach, I've been doing the work for like 30, 40 years, and I just want to send a message out to those that dealing with young people in the community. This is not a job. You got to either love it or get away from it. And if you don't love the people, you can't lead the people. One thing about young people, they're going to know once you're in their presence, whether you love them or not. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yep. Appreciate that. Yep. Thank you, OG1. Thank you. Are we? We still got time. We're good? Okay, we can. I did want to close with a quote. I did, uh, I went to a meeting earlier this year and I, someone did, did say, you know, I think he was the former mayor of Philadelphia. Public, uh, law enforcement is something that happens to you. Public safety is something that happens for you. And so that's definitely the side that we want to be on. So again, thank you all so much for coming and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>